Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings 2022 American Express final betting card, DraftKings picks, DraftKings ownership, and some props for you to get you through ways to waste your money this week in the PGA Tour. At least next week, we get the Farmers. We got some big names coming back. This is like the final warm-up event, so, you know, get all of your bad decision-making out of the way right now. If you've missed any of the shows throughout the week, I highly suggest that you go check those out. Remember to smash the like button for the episode, sub to Mayo Media Network, and subscribe to the newsletter as well, where you can find an absolute cheat sheet of everything, more research notes, all the quick links to the DraftKings cheat sheet, the betting picks, all of that stuff, plus NFL notes to go along with it. It gets sent right to you. It comes out on Wednesdays during golf season, along with Sunday nights to get you started on the week as well. So let's just jump right into it. The final betting card for the American Express from me this week. I made one late addition because, I mean, I might as well just put it underneath of a FOMO bet because I got two of those. But I went with Sungjae. Uh, I was trying to figure out who I wanted at the top of the board. A week coming off of being Nandercursed, never finished worse than 12th in three appearances at this tournament. We all liked him going into the century. That didn't work out, obviously. Being Andercurse didn't help, but he was a disaster. Round one at the Sony. Round two, he was actually pretty fine. So I think that he can cobble together... Some nice rounds here. 22 to 1 is a pretty good number, so I took it on Sung JM. I ended up betting Abraham Answer. I wasn't going to, and then I just thought, I bet him last week. I really liked him last week, and this is a much better spot for him than the Sony Open. So I might as well go back to the well at exactly the same number, 32 to 1. Actually, I lost a point. So instead of 33 to 1, it's 32 to 1 this week. That was the late ad for me. I'm using him a ton on DraftKings. I might as well put the outright on him as well. I like him at 32 to 1. And that's really it from the top of the board. The only one other bet that I have outside of a FOMO bet on C, woo, Kim, is going to be Christian Bezadenhout. That was the first click, don't mute me, uh, that I made this week. He is 66 to 1 with a top 5 each way. I mean, if he's not going to bleed strokes off the tee, he's pretty good everywhere else. And we saw his first positive result, or second positive result off the tee in 14 tournaments, the other one being the RBC Heritage from a year ago. So these shorter courses where distance means a little bit less, well, that necessarily means a little bit less. Because you can bomb and gouge PGA West, no problem. But you can also just hit a ton of fairways and be just as good as well. And we know that the Zayden Hout can do that. Just bring along that hot putter that we didn't see last week. Then we're in the money. It's 66 to 1, or at least with the top five. That'll be pretty good, I think. Then I got my three bombs. I got Gary Woodland, 110 to 1, with the top five each way. Lucas Glover, the glove, 150 to 1, with the top five each way. And then Francesco Malinari, 200 to 1, with the top five each way. Those are just pure speculation plays. Uh, there's been a lot of discourse this week about, you know, is this really a great spot for a long shot to win? And I think that over the past five years, we've seen that. Matt Jones actually posed the question of, like, is it just random noise that this has happened? And I actually don't think it is. And I could be completely wrong because it is a super small sample. The problem is when we're dealing with golf, especially with tournaments like this, is that it's all going to be a really small sample. Like the Masters, I suppose, is one thing. But even what you can take from five years ago doesn't necessarily mean what it means today. Yes, we still have the three-course rotation. We didn't have that a year ago. And as Tom Jacobs pointed out, that that was the year that we saw more of the favorites near the top of the leaderboard because they got to play the stadium course three times. I just think that there's a lot of variables that go into these three course rotations. Everyone gets three full rounds. Uh, these are easier courses, so it really mitigates the very top end talent. They're not as long, so the shorter hitters are more in play than they would be at a longer course. So I think all that goes into it. There's a pro-am element that the rounds take a little bit longer. The pins are in easier positions because of the amateurs, thus making it a little bit easier for the less skilled iron players to end up nearest the hole. And maybe they end up running a hot putting week and can get away with that. Maybe they all end up playing La Quinta is the easiest of the three courses, although they're all pretty easy. But maybe one day it plays slightly easier than the other two days. You can make up a stroke or two there, end up squeaking through the cut, and boom, you have a shot at winning this tournament. And I think the same thing applies to Pepper. Beach as well. And that's why we've seen Von Taylor win at huge odds. Ted Potter Jr. win at huge, huge odds. Nick Taylor win at huge odds there. That's not to say your Daniel Burgers and Jason Days and Jordan Spieth don't win there, just like John Rahm has won at the American Express. But we've also seen Andrew Landry at 200 to 1, Adam Long at 600 to 1. It just feels like these shorter courses that are a little bit easier, that have a few wonky rules that lead to more variance, could allow a path to a long shot winner emerging from the back as opposed to other courses where 
where, you know, most of the long shot winners are like 80 to 1, and it's usually one of the favorites. Plus, you have a huge skill gap at the very top. Like, we only have two truly elite players in this field, Rahm and Cantlay. Yes, Finau and Im and Scheffler and Answer, all these guys are really good, but it's not like we have Brooks. Bryson, Hideki, and like 10 of the top 15 players in the world at the very top. If Rom or Cantlay falters a little bit, even during one of the rounds, that might be enough to put them behind the eight ball and thus opening the door for someone in the back of the pack to come in. At least that's what I theorize. I could be completely wrong about this. I think this is a really fun discussion to have because I think it all comes down to is what is a decent sample size for golf? I mean, you could run this tournament 20 times and get really mixed results and not want to believe it, or you could run it five times and have to pick a lane. I'm under the impression that you want want to pick a lane, even though you know you may not be right, that it could be the exact opposite way that what you're thinking is that eventually you have to pick something that you believe in if you're going to be prognosticating golf or trying to come up with picks for a tournament and pick that lane and go with it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, you're right. Um, you don't want to really fence sit on this one. You can acknowledge that, you know, it could just be complete noise or you can be completely wrong. But at when we get to the conclusion of everything, you have a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis by putting your bets in play, and then you get the result. And maybe you're right this year, maybe you're wrong this year. It's a tough scene out there. This is what betting golf comes in. As Ryan Noonan pointed out on the DraftKings show this week, this is like the most random tournament of the year. Plus, there's 156 players in this tournament, too. It's as big of a field as you're going to see in golf throughout the course of the year. So there's a lot of different elements at play. My two FOMO bets of the week, I already mentioned C. Woo! Kim, 60 to 1, with a top 5 each way. And my guy, the Gim Reaper, 150 to 1, with a top 5 each way. I didn't play any first round leaders this week. I ended up playing four top 20s. I crowdsourced for a few of them. I got one from the crowd. The other three are just going to rest with me. I bet Lucas Glover 150 to 1 with the top 5. I'm also betting him top 20 at plus 450. Trey Mullenix, my guy with that Valero crossover that may or may not be true. Going with it anyway, because I like Trey Mullenix. 8 to 1 on the top 20. And her band Lahiri, plus 950 on the top 20. And then everyone's all over Austin Smotherman. Sure. 12 to 1. Why not? Uh, Jude pointed out he's just you know, a good ball striker. Could be a Pete Dye specialist. Maybe that's something that we'll see in the future. Who knows? Who knows what's going on with this? But 12 to 1 for Bryson and Harry Higgs, teammate at SMU. Let's have it. Uh, one and done's for the week for our mini contest. I have Sungjae, Jeff has answer, and Cust has Tony Finau, in case you were wondering. Let's shift over to the prize picks this week. Uh, and I think that there is, uh, I mean, I was wrong on my assumption last week. Like that was something that we talked about a little bit because the fairway percentage was way down at at Wileye last week. So I tried to play some unders. Didn't work out in the first round. Had I have continued with it throughout the course of the rest of the time, then it would have been fine. But here is the prize picks board for the week. Obviously, you can play any sport you want, but we're talking about golf, so we might as well hammer down on golf. And if you want like a free $100 bet on prize picks, super easy to do. Go to prizepicks.com, use code MMN, and they'll give you a match deposit of up to $100. So you deposit $100, you get another $100 to make your wagers with. So then you have another $100 left over to fire away in case you lose this time around. So this is what I ended up going with for this week. Uh, you have to play one over and one under at least. You can play up to five. Uh, I like Sungjae this week, so I'm going to go total Final finishing position under 19 and a half. I like Abraham Answer this week. So I'm going to go Abraham Answer under 22 and a half final position. And Russell Henley has really been on the struggle bus at this tournament. And hopefully, uh, you know, maybe last week's collapse on the back nine lingers for a little bit more. And we'll go with that. I've already put this one in. So we'll go under, under, and over. Uh, 75 pays three something. Let's see. 75 is what I put in for. Yeah, 375. 75 pays 375 uh, for this one. So that's what I'm going with. But as you can see, there's a bunch of different things that you can go with uh, on prize picks this week. You can have the finishing position or you can have the single rounds. You can do birdies or better. A lot of these guys are starting off at La Quinta, like John Rahm and Patrick Cantlay. Over under six and a half is pretty tough, but you can find some like sneaky ones from the bottom here if you want to go with someone like Phil who still makes a ton of birdies um, and is playing an easy course on Thursday. You can kind of drop into this each and every day if you want to come back to it. You can go 
with the fantasy score uh, for the round one versus a par 72. Uh, you can just say, do they shoot 67.5 better or worse kind of thing? I mean, that's an interesting way to play this. And if guys are playing La Quinta, uh, it is a par 72. So you're asking Rom to go six under or better. Uh, I guess it would be five under or better. If he shoots a 67, he would win if you end up going under on him. But those are just different ways that you can play it on prize picks. Kind of whatever you want to do, greens and regulation for a single round, fairways hit for a single round, all different ways that you can play it. Uh, but like I said, I like him and answer under their finishing position numbers for the full tournament and Russell Henley over his finishing position for the entire tournament. 75 pays 375 at prizepicks.com. And once again, you can go code MMN at first deposit. You can also find the link down in the description uh, and you have a deposit match of up to a hundred bucks. Plus they're going to have some like super duper good Super Bowl like props that are like guaranteed winners or at least one piece that's a guaranteed winner. I uh, will end up paying like at least three times your money. So I highly recommend that you check out prize picks right now. On the DraftKings side of things, I decided to go through with what I was preaching with Noonan on the DraftKings show. I played 32 lineups this week, and 11 of them have the John Rom patrick Cantlay stack. So in case you're wondering, who are the like jabronis that I filled out the bottom of my lineup with? A lot of those guys that I played the top 20s with. So uh, I didn't really overload on any one guy from the 6,000s. I just kind of played a mix and match, played the shuffle. Hopefully it ends up coming through that one or two of these guys can sneak through, and fingers crossed that they're paired together. I mean, ideally. All these guys would come through for me, but of names in the $6,000 range that I ended up playing as the double anchors at the very bottom of these Cantlay and Rom teams were, I guess we can start at 71. I got Putnam, Molinari, Chad, Ramey, Hudson, Swafford, Nasty, Nate Lashley, and her band Lahiri, Trey Molinix, David Lipsky, Austin Smotherman, and Brandon Haggy. So essentially I built out like the Rick Gaiman cascading effect. I had the pyramid where I have my solid names at the top. Like I think I only have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys from $8,000 and above in play in my lineup. A few guys from the upper sevens, and it's really just a mismatch of these guys in the bottom. The tighter that you can keep your core, even with 30 lineups, 32 lineups, 50 lineups, 20 lineups, whatever it's going to be, the tighter that you can make your core on DraftKings is going to be the easiest way to maximize your correct weeks. Because not everyone, I mean, most people are going to be wrong most weeks. As evidenced by anyone watching the show who plays DraftKings every single week for golf, you know you're going to be wrong. But you know those weeks when you are right, but you just don't have the right combinations? It's likely because you made your player pool too big. And if you had just concentrated a little bit more, that maybe you would have a shot at the top of the leaderboard. Now, it's going to make like treading water a little bit more difficult or gaining some of your money back during the week. That's not the game that I'm playing. I'm playing for first place or I'm going to lose all my money. I mean, sometimes I end up like breaking even for the week because I have one hot lineup that ends up getting through. But most cases, the tighter you can make your core, the better off that you're going to be. Drafting showdown wise, uh, this is a little bit tricky because round two showdown might be a bit easier to play than round one showdown. I only say this because I think that you want to just pure core stack La Quinta and hope to get lucky with Eagles on that course. That could be the major differentiator. The issue with we round one at La Quinta is that's where all the guys that everyone wants to play are playing. So Rom and Cantlay. Let me just pull up my round one. I ended up, instead of playing first round leaders, I just played 20 lineups uh, into the $10 on DraftKings Showdown round one. I'll probably do the same thing for round two as well. But like some of the guys that are playing on round one, just for example, we got Rom, Cantlay, Finau, Tringali, Bezadenhout, Ortiz, Glover, Munoz, Champ, Shez Reevy, Alex Smalley, Harry Higgs, Swafford, Aaron Rye, Molinari, Lahiri, Trey Mullenix, like all guys that I'm using in the core of those 20 lineups. But like everyone wants to use Rom. Everyone wants to use Cantlay, Finau. Bezadenhout's going to be a pretty popular sleeper this week uh even Reevy, champ glover munoz knox like these are all players that people would have targeted anyway regardless of looking at whatever course so you might get some overlap with the people that are directly stacking at a particular course versus the people that are just picking the names that they like that they might end up with a lot of people at la quinta anyway round two and round three when these names are at the other courses that might be the better pivot move to go back to la quinta uh because fewer people are going to be taking the roms and the cantleys of the world especially if la quinta plays is the easiest in round one, then most people, I mean, most your general public in DraftKings Showdown just takes the guys at the top of the leaderboard anyway. So that's probably the way that it's going to end up rolling here. So I wouldn't give up on DraftKings Showdown for this week if round one doesn't work out because you can go back for round two and round three. And I think you can create more leverage on the field in round two and round three if that's just the way that you want to play it. 
DraftKings ownership for the week. Uh, I'm going to call these guesses because they are most certainly not projections, but based off what I've seen on Fantasy National and then just tracking the sentiments from people that I've seen being talked about a lot around the biz, as they call it. Patrick Cantlay, because he's the discount off John Rahm, is likely to be the highest owned golfer this week with Rahm coming in second. But that's why I wanted to pair them together, because I think that's a way to leverage both of them, because very few people are going to play them both together. Like if Cantley is 30% and Rom is 25%, I don't really know what the combination is going to be of both those guys in a single lineup. But I'd say it's probably less than 5%, because the back end of your roster, not great if you start playing those two guys. Answer and Power from the 9Ks, I think are going to be pretty popular. Sungjae should be reasonably popular, along with Connors as well, and the Gucci Man. But those two in particular, answers and power, Answer and Power. Christian Bezadenhout in the 8s looks to be the one who is rising up above the rest in terms of ownership. Luke List and Johnny Vegas are kind of milling about as well. Michael Thompson and Adam Svensson in the $7,000 range seem like they have the grip uh, on where everyone is going. But you also have Hayden Buckley and Adam Hadwin. Uh, Johnny Vegas should, at 8,100 should be reasonably popular. The Glove, Putnam, Chris Kirk, like all these guys are in the mix, but not quite as high as those two, at least from what I'm seeing at the moment. That does present some pretty decent pivot plays if that's how you want to go. Just if you want to play pure ownership plays, it doesn't seem like really anyone's going to Finau. Now he is Andrew Kerr, so keep that in mind. But he might come in at single digits from the top end of the board. Scheffler's not super popular either, just because Rom and Cantley are soaking up so much ownership. Beyond Vegas and Bezaden Houghton list, almost everyone in the $8,000 range is going to come in probably single digit. So if you like Fowler, I don't mind Fowler this week, or even Siwoo or Ortiz. I mean, Reed, no one's going to own him. Cameron Tringali, no one's going to own him. They're probably both overpriced, but if you're trying to leverage yourself out of it, I mean, those are guys that can really make your teams different if that's the route that you want to go down. In the 7Ks, uh, I went with Cameron Champ as my pivot play. I don't really have a ton of faith. I almost added him to the betting card as well. I still might, just for kicks at 125 to 1. He's like Ricky Bobby. He's like first or last. So if he ends up coming out and having a good week in California, very familiar with these California greens and elements. Uh, and if you I mean, there's a ton of par fives at all these courses. If he can score on those, he's in pretty decent shape as long as the putter comes along with him. I mean, he's yeah, he, he contracted COVID. That's why he didn't play in the century. But $7,800 and he falls right in between Knox, Kirk, Woodland, Reavy, Glover, uh, Michael Thompson. Like all these guys were garnering ownership and just leaving him to the wayside. Grio as well. No one is using Grio. When you check the newsletter, you'll find some decent Grio stats in there. I couldn't pull the trigger on them, but uh, maybe you will. Maybe you have the guts. Maybe you're the Ben Raza types out there, and you can pull the trigger on the DraftKings ownership with them. So in terms of one and done this week in the giant tournament, uh, I have four teams, so I'm just going to kind of scatter shot. Probably not going to use Rom. I might use Cantlay on one of those teams. Um, Fafino actually does sign up. I might... It's really tough because I'll probably use Answer on one of the teams. I'll probably use Bezadenhout on one of the teams. Can't lay on one of the teams. And then that leaves like your Seamus Powers, Corey Connors, Matthew Wolfs, like someone in that range. Zala Torres might be like, because he hasn't played so far this season, ditto with Scheffler. That might like steer people in a different direction that this might be the time to jump on and take them in a one and done to try to get lower ownership. So I, I think there's many different ways that you can play this. I'm really trying to narrow down who I want to use in the thousand dollar entry. I used Gooch last week. I switched off power at the last second for Gooch, which I think would have had me in second place had I have used Gooch or had I have used power. But, you know, it's not the end of the world. Sometimes you have to fight, live to fight another day. Hopefully we can mine a winner, but I want to stay as close to the top of the leader board as possible in terms of the betting odds. I mean, had I have followed my own advice with Hideki last week, then I would have had a bunch of money in one and done. Congratulations to the less than 100 people who took Hideki in the giant one and done, but you had the guts, you went through with it, you looked past the numbers and said, hey, this is good value. This is an elite player that no one is taking. I will choose to take them. And it paid huge dividends because not only did he win, no one else really had him. And that is the strategy that I've always talked about in one and done, but I'm just too big of a coward to put that in play. Play in the DraftKings Listeners League, by the way. It's 2,500 spots this week. There's 300 spots left. Link is down in the description. So I'd like to fill that as quickly as possible so we can bump it up to 3,000 next week. But if this festers and lingers, then we're not going to have that ability. We want as much rake-free money as possible. So spread the word. And the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League, the link 
is down in the description, as is the link to prize picks. Once again, code MMN at first deposit gets you a deposit match of up to $100. Deposit $100, get another $100. It's a free $100 wager. And you can play it across sports if you want to. I'm just sticking to golf. I'll have some NFL ones later in the week in the newsletter as well. Sub to that while you're here. Smash the like, sub to the channel, rate and review the podcast, and check out the European Tour Picks and Bet Show with Tom and Sky as they gave out some winners. I'm tailing Sky and Tom on, of course, Guido at 140 to 1 with the top five each way, and How Tom at 125 to 1 with the top five each way. Very minimal investment for me over in Abu Dhabi, but you know, when I wake up very early in the morning with my son and flip on Golf Channel, then I got something to watch and something to root for. It's great fun. All right, thank you guys all for watching. Good luck at the American Express. Good luck in Abu Dhabi. Good luck on the Corn Ferry Tour, if that's what you're playing. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!